to Adjusted Reality, a podcast series trusted by the adjusted and brought to you by the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress, where we learn from athletes, celebrities, influencers, and healthcare professionals about how to optimize health in a fun, relatable way. Join me, Dr. Sherry McAllister, as I speak to retired Brigadier General Becky Halstead about her years in service the leadership tactics she learned, and how those tactics can be applied to help veterans during this national opioid crisis. Becky Halstead, a retired Brigadier General, founded her own leader consultancy company, Steadfast Leadership, following 27 years of service in the United States Army. She specializes in inspirational and motivational speaking, developing leader training programs, leader coaching, and mentoring. Becky has provided hundreds of keynote speeches and leadership training to the corporate and academic sectors at both national and international engagements. Some of Becky's achievements include being selected to attend West Point in 1977 and being the first from her hometown to graduate from West Point. Becky was the first female graduate of West Point to be promoted to general officer in 2004 and served and commanded in combat as the first female commanding general at the strategic level of leadership in Iraq, leading 20,000 soldiers and 5,000 civilians in 2005, a first for our army and our fabulous nation. In 2007, she received the National Women's History Project Award for generations of women moving history forward. I cannot be more excited to have retired Brigadier General Becky Halstead with us. Welcome. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be back with you, Sherry. It's been a while. Oh, it has been, and you are a force of so many good things, and that's why I am delighted for our audience to hear some of the amazing experiences you have, but the true leadership, the authenticity, and the respect that you've commanded over the years. We're going to jump right in, and I'm going to ask you this. You've received quite the achievements over the years. Was it always your dream to be in such a leadership position? No. No. No, no. I mean, people do ask me that, like, did you always want to be a general, um, those kinds of things. And candidly, no. I mean, it's just one of those things where it's like, but I'm not allowing myself to go there. Right. So my my dream, uh, my expectation, my goal was what whenever I left the service, whether it was after my five year commitment or it was after you name a a rank that you that I achieved, it was, let it be said, well done, good and faithful servant, you know, but not worry about the title, right? Just that, you know, whatever, however long I stayed, whatever I was at, whatever teams I was on, that we made a difference. So that was way more important to me than some achievement, right? Right. It's, it's refreshing to hear that because so many times you have leadership that said, I've always dreamed about this position. I, I saw it, I visioned it, I, I put visionary boards together and it's refreshing and, and really important because so many of us, we're still trying to figure out our why and why are we doing this? Is this the right thing for me to be doing? And as we look at the experiences you've had, especially as a woman in a place where it was completely male dominated, I want to ask you this as the female commanding general at the strategic level in leadership in Iraq, what was it like to know that you were the first? You know, Candidly, I, I wasn't focused too much on being the first. I mean, initially when it happened, right, everybody was talking about it, some in favor, some not in favor. Um, so it bothered, bothered me more that there were actually some people that still had issue with that, right? And I know, by the way, very important to state that my left and right hand men were women. So, you know, um, I when I speak on leadership, quite often I put that picture up because um, the two, my two top, uh, officers, deputy commander, chief of staff were also women. And, and 
you know, all of a sudden some people just realize like, oh my goodness, there are three women at the top of this organization. Like, how, how, how did that happen? And I kind of laugh and go, oh, somebody was asleep at the wheel. But, you know, the bottom line is there are three men at the top of all these other organizations and nobody ever says anything. Like, that's no big deal. So these women were my friends. These were women that I grew up with, just like probably whatever two men they might have selected were probably been men that I grew up with in the military. But I just pulled them aside and said, hey, um, there are going to be people, people that are cheering us on, and there's going to be people who are waiting for us to make our first mistake and go down. Um, but he, I want to pull you in, and I want to talk about a couple of things. Number one, we'll do none of this. We won't do any interviews. We're not going to do any articles. We're not doing TV, whatever. We're not. We're going to stay out of the spotlight because um, if when we get back after our mission in Iraq is over. If people then want to talk about the story, great, because then it's then it's been done. It's been history and we were either successful or not. Um, so I didn't want to bring much attention to it. And we were friends. And so the other thing that was really important to me was to let them know that um, I didn't I did not expect our friendship to be in any way a casualty uh, on the battlefield, because, you know, it is difficult when friends work for you, but it's not impossible you know, respect can still be there and professionalism can still be there. And I said, that's another thing that people will be watching, you know, is their favoritism. You can't have favoritism. Um, you know, you do like some people better than others, but you can't show favoritism. So, so yeah, so, um, you know, I never, I never dreamed that that would happen. And then it did. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, who would have thought a country girl? <laughs> it's, it's amazing that, it has happened now. We're starting to recognize the importance that your leadership, your skill sets, your your ability to have stepped up and did such a fantastic job. And you're right. I'm sure at the time, and, and I totally understand you not wanting to bring any spotlight to it because you don't know how this is going to turn out. And right. you don't want to make the, like, much like being the first astronaut in space, you don't want to make any major mistakes and, and have it look poorly in the future. You've right. opened a tremendous door and thinking through how many young girls that might be listening to this podcast right now have that dream and inspiration that they can do things that are um, maybe considered uh, more difficult to get into and right. your leadership right. skills, and especially having your friends with you. And you're right there. There's always a opportunity to hurt relationships when there's leadership and command that has to be uh, reviewed and and understood. Yep. I mean, you see that in your own community all the time. You know, you're very tight knit, close group. Uh, um, you know, an office, a practice is very tight. You know, at the end of the day, you know, you, you care about each other, you take care of each other. But you know, when things when when people aren't living up to the standard, the consequences have to happen. You can't just like hide it under a rug or whatever, you know, and, and I think this whole concept of leadership is candidly, it's unfortunate that leadership isn't a mandatory course in grade school, high school, college, because, you know, you can be the best doctor, you can be the best, whatever, but if you don't know how to lead a team, um, candidly, you might be very unsuccessful because it's more than just being the subject matter expert. It's also about pulling a team together and being very successful and being very efficient and effective. Um, you know, and I've seen, I've seen a lot of people that are very, very smart, very intelligent, and they lose their business or they lose their practice or they lose their livelihood because they did not know how to lead a team that they put together. So it's a fascinating subject to me. I know that you've gone across the nation back and forth and you're one person who most definitely has put the airline miles in probably around the world three times at this point. But as you speak to uh, the opportunity in leadership and you're right, we are especially our teachers from kindergarten up embracing these skill sets for leadership and what it really means because it does make the world a better place leadership doesn't just speak to i'm going to lead people need to follow but it speaks to respect it speaks to honesty moral compass and fortitude 
how you're going to look at the future, how are you going to respect the people that work with you? And as you've done these keynote lectures, um, tell me a little bit about if there was, if you had to boil it down to beginning in the leadership and some of the tactics that you used both on the field and now in your leadership teaching and instruction role, tell me some of the things that you wish you would have known way back when, before you even got into West Point. Mm, that I wish I would have known. So, you know, cause, cause it seems like the learning is somewhat cumulative, right? Make mistake, learn. Um, learn learn by being trained and then execute it and go wow that worked um but i guess maybe one of the one of the biggest things for me would be to realize that there are going to be a lot of people who aren't joyful for your success right that um they may appear like they're an encourager um but they don't really care and that that was very hard for me to accept moving up the ranks um, was that sometimes people that I thought were my friends, they weren't. And they were all, it was all about them. And I learned at a very young age that leadership is about being selfless, that leadership is about others. Yes, I have to lead myself first. I have to be the standard and the example, but I do that because I can't expect it of someone else without doing it myself. But at the end of the day, Almost everything I do ought to be for others, ought to be for helping others, help, help them find a better version of themselves, help them to grow and develop. You know, I always say, I'm not in the business of, of growing of followers. I'm in the business of growing leaders, right? And I felt that way in the military as well. But I think that um, the old choose your friends wisely, probably I should have practiced a little bit earlier than I did. I mean, I think I probably heard it. But I, I think I probably didn't really believe that people would actually uh, be in your circle just to be in your circle for what they can get out of it, you know. Um, so I think part of me would say, hey, don't stop being selfless just because others are not, right? In that way, be the example. But it is really easy to get caught up in, well, if that's what it takes to get to the next rank or the next level of leadership, I guess you can't beat them, join them. Don't do that, um, you know, right? And then on the other hand, like when I when I go back to think about when I was a younger leader, there are times that I wish I could do over because I think I was so competitive and so about my team being first that I didn't worry too much about the impact on another another team. And yet we're all part of the big army. And so I think I also learned that the hard way. So I probably go back and tell my old self, hey, at the end of the day, you got to do what's best for the team. I equate it to playing basketball. You know, I might be a great shot. And, um, and so um, I have lots of opportunity to make two points, make three points. But we're gambling on that today I'm a good shot, which not every day are you a good shot. And so if I'm always taking the good shot, because I'm a pretty good shooter and I never pass it to anybody else who has a sure shot, right? Simple layup over a long three pointer. Um, then I'm not really leading. And I think leaders also have to assist. Right. And I, and I learned that from my, my roommate at West Point. I mean, she was an incredible basketball player. And sometimes I'd be like, take the shot. And, and then out of nowhere, she'd like bounce it in, pass it in and give it to someone right under the net. And it was a sure two points. And we won many games because of her thinking and leading that way versus losing games where maybe she was at least able to, you know, get a new statistic of high score. But if the team loses and you get high score, that doesn't make sense to me. I'd rather get not set another record for myself and the team win. So does that make sense? It does. Absolutely. As you said that, you brought to mind someone that I really look up to, and it's Mother Teresa. And, and one of her oh, yes. favorite poems is, people are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. Yeah, love them through it, I say, right? Love them through it. It is. It, it, yeah. builds, it builds your character, too. And, and in a world that's so fast-paced, sometimes it's not that we are, are malicious or maligned. It's, it's simply sometimes... We're just so fast paced that we don't stop 
and find the clarity and recognize the authenticity of true leadership, that it's really from the heart. It's leading from that place. When we push people, our children, our students, whatever, to be get out there and be successful. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? We want people to be successful. We don't push them to go be failures. But, but I think what we fail to do is say, we're, we're pushing you to be successful because we want, to, we want you to use that success for the benefit of others. So like I'm always telling everybody, you know, in my leadership talks, look, probably most of you that I'm looking at are successful. Probably most of the people that are listening to this podcast, they are successful and they're actually trying to take themselves to a new level. That's why they listen to podcasts, right? And they hear something new that helps uh, get a better version of themselves. But the thing is, is that how do you use that success? And, and if, you know, that Mother Teresa, she was significant. Her life made a difference. And that, you know, so we got to think about what's the purpose of your life? And it ought to be to make a difference, not to have a title, not to have a certain level of success. So success is good and it helps you do more for other people. But you, you and I know we're around a lot of successful people that do nothing for anybody else. And it's to me, that's so sad. That means, you know, God has blessed you with talents and gifts and success and everything else. And what, you're going to keep it all to yourself? You know, I, I was telling a group one day, I said, I don't know what year it was, but probably most of us, if we think about this, you come down on Christmas morning and you look underneath the tree and you want to see where are your gifts, right? And do you have the biggest one? Do you have one or the, that's wrapped and looks like exactly what you asked for? I can remember I asked for a guitar for one year. I was in seventh grade. I came down, looked on the tree. There's clearly no guitar under there. Well, my parents didn't wrap it. It was in their closet and I got it anyhow. But sometime after that, it changed to where I couldn't wait to go down for Christmas morning, not for my gifts that I was going to get, but to watch the expression on my family members when they opened the gift that I had spent some time really thinking about them and giving to them. When you have that switch in your life, that's when you realize you're living with purpose and for others, in my mind. I, I very much agree. I also think back to the statement, and I, I have to reflect on this because you and I are both very, very busy crossing the nation back and forth. We're probably yeah. just waving at each other in an airplane. Hi, in the airport. Hi, Becky. But <laughs> the, the other statement that Mother Teresa made is, if you want to change the world, go home and hug your family. Yeah. And yeah. it really starts with our lives at home. And I, I am appreciative that you share your Christmas story with us because it's those memories of not what we get, but in fact, what we give to create right. this beautiful world that we're living in. And unfortunately, not all things are beautiful. And I want to ask you about no. this. So here we go with a severely impacted world right now, living in an epidemic of opioid use, misuse, and abuse. We're living through a pandemic of social isolation, depression, sadness, a mental health crisis that has been brought on through a, a flux, an influx, where our children are actually having those um, desires to need counseling and reach out to others, our veterans. And we are so mm -hmm. grateful for your service and all of our active military and veterans that are out there from all of us to all of you. You make our world a safer place and freedom is a an amazing an amazing um word and idea and what that means and how our people come together to do the the great moments good people doing great things but i have to ask since we are struggling in in many of the military Tell me from your perspective, especially when it involves suicide and drug use, tell us where you were at and where you had to come from in your own health crisis. Right. Well, you know, I, I, I retired because I had the kind of fibromyalgia and, you know, and I'm on the road now. I'm in New York, so I don't have it with me. But if I was home, I could pull out of a bottom drawer this bag full of prescription medication, 15 different types in my last year in the army where, you know, I mean, the solution really was, oh, you can't sleep, take this. Oh, you're in pain, take this. 
um, you know, or your skin is burning all over and it feels like pins and needles take this. And so it's just like, and if three works, six will be better. And, you know, and it was, I'm not, not in any way um, shaming the, you know, the military medical system. It's just the big machine. We've got a war going on. We've got people doing multiple deployments and coming back. And so the quickest short term fix is really can we give you a prescription? that's a gap filler makes you feel a little better props you up helps you do your job well enough to keep going and then while that's happening we'll try to get to the real diagnosis and whatever else. so i found myself in that situation as i came back from iraq and took over another you know i tried to cut it out I, I went for almost 18 to 20 months um and then i just realized this this isn't working i mean i can't do it i i i'm taking I'm taking all these prescription medications. I'm not getting any better. Um, and as you know, my dear friend, Carolyn Malizia was, uh, she had reached out to me before that and said, I can help you. You don't have to be in all this pain. But while I was in the military, there was no, there was no um, avenue for me to go to chiropractic within the military. Uh, so my solution was to hire, you know, cut sling load. Um, as we say, and then go and focus on my health. And I did. And then I went to her um, and through many things, not the least of which was, you know, chiropractic and adjustment and you know, getting off of the prescriptions. I, I like to say, if I drew a chart, it would be prescriptions up here and they steadily decline and pull through supplements down here and they steadily increase. Because one of Caroline's favorite things was well just because you don't eat it doesn't mean you don't need it and of course she introduced me to Charlie Dubois and their process and and all and all their supplements are different formulas from food you know and I thought well how brilliant you know I, I I'm not going to get addicted I'm not going to overdose I'm not going to have suicidal ideations um and I'm going to get healthy right so I had to go through this whole transformation and of course, in the process, then I met up with you all and got asked to be a spokesperson for chiropractic because a, a lot of these things go hand in hand. You know, the chiropractic is let's get the nervous system, the spinal cord and all that right, sending out the right messages. But a lot of us have had, especially in the military, you know, you've got the wounded. In my case, I had three major surgeries. So we have things that really disrupt our whole health system. Um, and we don't have available in the military those things. Some people can't handle it. They get them, you know, they emotionally can't handle it. And they go with the drug route. They go the prescription route. And candidly, you know, I mean, I think we probably have suicides that were not intentional, right? That Absolutely. drink a few beers, have, you know, I have the prescriptions and I drink a few beers and then we walk into a soldier's room and, you know, and, and they have not survived the night. I'm not so sure potentially meant to kill ourselves, but that was the that was the end state, right? So in getting involved with the foundation and getting involved with uh, you know Carol Ann and, and then of course standard process rights and all that was okay, there are other solutions. And our military and our veterans, the more we can educate them that there are other solutions, we could probably save some lives. We could improve the quality of life of a lot of people. So you know, I, I do try very hard to educate people along the way, even when I'm speaking. You know, I wrote a book on leadership, but at the end of the day, it's all about leading yourself. So you got to lead yourself to good health too, right? And so I always tell everybody in the military, I was physically fit, you know, 12 mile foot marches, jumping out of helicopters, um, you know, carrying heavy rucksacks, but I wasn't healthy. Now I'm healthy. Take no prescription medications. Thank you to Carol Ann and many others. No prescription medications, supplements, and all those other things. Get adjusted, go to a chiropractor. Um, so now I'm healthy, but I could be a little more physically fit. You are vibrant. And if, <laughs> if, if you could actually see the video, you're talking to a young lady. I mean, I... 
I look at you, Becky, and I can't imagine that you've had 27 years of experience in anything based on how I'm looking at you and how you glow with energy and enthusiasm. And you're right. There, there's a balancing act that happens in our lives. And we do have the importance of taking care of things that are surgical in, in, in its, its um, experience. And the, the other piece of this is non-pharmacological was put last in many cases in the past. Yes. And now, I think as we try to actively help others, we want to put it first because isn't it more sensical to have a non-pharmacological first have that fail than to have some um, addictive product in your life that yeah. may be working for today, but then you have to take more or worse, like you said, accidentally, you know, you're having a good time at a party, you take your pain meds, and then we have this tragic outcome. So I think we're at a precipice in history, like never before, where leadership is critical of ourselves describe mm -hmm. describe the book you wrote and why you wrote it because it does lead into taking care of our own health needs and you're really that spokesperson for going from hey i'm really ailing to this amazing vibrant and, and flourishing woman well i wrote the book because i speak on leadership and people would come up to me and say please tell me you've written a book and i'd have to say oh, no working on it you know and so now I actually refer to my book as a thick business book, right? So you, anybody that's out there that writes books will tell you, you don't write books to make money. You write books to be able to share messages, right? right. That you believe are important and that work for you. And so, you know, it took me a while to write it because it's a lot of angles to leadership. And I thought, well, if I want to get, and I'm hoping this is the first book of others, but you know, I haven't written any others yet, but I got lots of outlines. But um, so my thought was, well, if I only get one out there, you know, what, what could be the most meaningful to help people take action, right? Mm -hmm. So how could I ignite people to action? And so it's much of what we're talking about, which is um, we as a society have become very dependent on everything else. Take a pill if you're ailing, ailing um, let the government give you a can't make ends meet or you know you in whatever i mean so it's it's a more of a take society than a give society and it's more of a follow society than a lead society so to me i thought well i have spent my whole life knowing that there were going to be obstacles and challenges in front of me and i never expected someone else to pull me out of it or pull me through it oh god because he's always with me but no human so if that's the case, how do I partner with God, make that happen, right? So the way I, I knew I had to do it was lead myself first. And so I, I kind of wanted to take people back to basics in this book, which is, look, every single one. And, and, and then also the other is people are like cop outs when it comes to leading. They're like, oh, it must be nice. You got the gene for leadership. Excuse me? You know? You don't have to have other people to lead. You have at least one person and that's yourself. So therefore, I dub you a leader. Everybody's a leader. But at least lead yourself. And if we were all leading ourselves with character and competence, with empathy, with compassion, and discipline, wouldn't the world be a better place to live in? Like, instead of looking away, you would help someone. Um, you know, when the standard isn't being met, somebody's breaking the rules, you would report it. You'd take action instead of go, well, not my lane, you know, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm just amazed. So I wrote it to try to go, it's just one small effort to try to get people to scratch their head and go, you know, you're absolutely right. How can I complain about everybody else if I'm not doing it myself? So the, the concept behind the book was first person you must lead is you. And it's a choice. You're either choosing to lead yourself or you're choosing not to. And if you decide to lead yourself with character and competence, you will find a better version of yourself and you will ignite in others um, action. Right. And and I, I, I even put in there, I say to people, OK, and if you do lead a team, ask yourself this. Would you want to would you would you would you want to work for yourself? Right. Because you know, I have worked for some people and I go like, wow, I can't believe they think they're a leader because they're just so toxic and they're so, 
you know, they don't listen and it's, it's their way or the highway. And I thought, well, I'm just going to ask people in the book, if you had to work for yourself, would you enjoy it? Like if you, if you were in receipt of the emails you sent today, would you think they were appropriate, respectful, professional, you know? And if the answer is no, you got some behaviors to change. It's, it's a very deep concept if you sit and you contemplate leading yourself and wanting to be that person who could be led by you. Yeah. And you, if you reflect on it as a third person, you become aware of some of your misgivings because it, you will oftentimes see that kindness plays a role in everyone's life. Are you yeah. being that? Are you being a kind leader? And are you being truthful to not only yourself, but the people that you lead? Because you can put on a happy face every day and be completely disingenuous. I watch and learn from others and I watch their body language. Yeah. And that's one of the key things, Becky, that I think you do so very well is, is you're, you're, you're in the moment. You think about what's going on around you. You think about how the other person is contemplating what you're saying and lead yourself. It's timeless. It's, it's not going to have a, well, this is for generation X. This is for generation Z. Right, this is right. a timeless book that can keep growing on you through your life. Because what you do in your 20s is not what you're going to do in your 60s. Yet being able to lead and create that environment that helps you be at your top of the game. And, and honestly, the more we le learn about ourselves, I think the more we can give to our leadership tactics. And talking about leadership tactics and leading yourself and especially your health, right now we're in an influx of many different forces coming to our veterans and our military. And I'd like, if you would, please um, consider the audience active duty military and veterans reaching for themselves to be um, the best they can be. And if they are contemplating suicide, which I know many of you out there have considered, what, what advice, Becky, would you give them not only on their health, but their own personal morale and how they're feeling right now? Sure. So... You know, I remember in Iraq uh, visiting a soldier at the hospital, and oddly enough, um, that soldier was in the vehicle of a, another soldier that was killed, and the anniversary of his death is today. And I talked to his parents last night and, and all. And I remember going to visit this sergeant in the uh, hospital there in Balad, Iraq. And he was, he was distraught. You know, he was really beside himself. Um, he was beside himself for a lot of reasons. One, because his buddy got killed. Two, because his buddy volunteered to be in the convoy. It was going to be his last convoy, and then he'd be going home. He'd been over there for a whole year. But, you know, he volunteered because, you know, he, he, he knew a lot about security and everything else, and he felt like he needed his help, so he did. And... So it was very evident to me that this young man was very suicidal. You know, you can just tell, right? You know, why, why did he have to die and, and I live? And how can I go on living? And, and, and candidly, I, I had never been in that situation in the, in the military because I've not, I've not been to combat. This is my very first two weeks in combat in Iraq visiting. And, and you know, I was like, so you sound like you talked to a lot of soldiers before that if you've not been in combat that are going through that. And so, you know, candidly, I wasn't sure what I was going to say, but that's when you're like praying at the same time. You just go, you know, if God gives me the right words. And, and, I, and, I, and I listened to him. So well, number one, for anybody that's helping people, listen, you know, listen, don't be prescriptive, you know, don't be, you know, don't, and don't be uh, like build a bridge over it, you know, listen, be empathetic. And, and when he was done, um, what I chose to do, and I believe was a good thing to do, was I tried to put it in the perspective of his friend that had died. And I said, you know, he volunteered to be on that convoy. That's how much he loved you. I mean, that's how much he loved you. He, he, knew, the, he knew the risk. And I said, um, don't you think he would just be beating you up a little bit that you're, you're 
questioning all this and maybe even thinking, you know, I don't deserve to live because he died. You know, if you, if you kill yourself over this, you know what just happened? The enemy won twice, not just once, they won twice. Do you really want the enemy to win twice? Or would you rather honor your buddy by living your life out, you know? I mean, let's just think about our, our, our battle buddy, our friend, Carolyn Olivia. I don't think it could, and to me, it was just like so unfair. Here's this beautiful person, you know, all about right and health and everything else. And then she just got the whammy, right? You know, and, and young. And it, it just blew, it blows all of our mind, not fair. But it, if we stop promoting and believing and, and leading ourselves and all the things that she taught us, well, that would be such an insult. And that would be giving up on what we really believe. So it's not ours to question, but it is ours to make a difference later. So I just said, don't let the enemy win twice, buddy. And that's the only thing I know how to do, you know, I mean, uh, in terms of trying to help them out of it. And then I also do quite often, you know, think about your family, think about your other friends. You have a lot to live for, um, you know, it's. I suppose for me, anytime I've been in a very bad place, I ultimately get back to, would this destroy my mother and father? Because if it would destroy my mother and father, then I'm obviously making the wrong decision. You know, like if they would be so incredibly sad, how, how, how could I do it, right? Um, and that doesn't mean that immediately now you feel like living and you're happy and you're all robust. It just means it's a spark. Now start building on that. And maybe the other thing I would say is, and trying to work on yourself, help others. Because you're never alone. There are, there, are, there are so many others that are in this valley. And I think some of the some of the folks that have really pulled themselves out of that valley, the greatest joy for them is to help others. So oh, that is so true. And a powerful story. And for our audience, Dr. Carol Amelizia was a board member of the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress. She gave tirelessly to promoting health and wellness and was a lead figure in the chiropractic profession, brought Becky to us as a, a leader in and of itself in, in the military and also a leader in just being able to create environments that are positive, stepping away from toxic, yeah. stepping away from selfish and being selfless. And that really does make the world a better place. And for those active military and veterans that are listening to this podcast today, we are so grateful for all you do. And Becky said it best, think of your friends, your family, and the service to others, and your life is extraordinarily valuable. You have an opportunity to continue to give, and don't let that enemy win twice. Yeah. That is a powerful statement. Becky, I could spend all day, every day with you and, and <laughs> enjoy every moment that we have. I think chiropractic has changed lives. It's changed the way people look at things and the things they look at then begin to change as a non-pharmacological option to their health, their well-being, and what it means to really create vibrancy and have those moments. I'm I'm so glad that you're now in that holistic space of, you know, just because you don't eat it doesn't mean you don't need it. I think that's a very important statement too, for those that are listening. So many great opportunities, but Becky, thank you. If you could leave our audience with one thought for today, what would that be? Um, one thought. I'm not very good with one thought. Uh, Do three if you like. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I would encourage people to be themselves, right? I mean, God created every single one of us differently. You know, you talked earlier about strengths and weaknesses. And I always tell I always tell everybody, I said, uh, you know, and we all have both. I mean, in the book, I write about failure because anybody that's just going to stand up and pound their chest and tell you how they got it all right, how their practice was perfect, or their career was perfect, you know, they're just, they're only remembering those things. We all fail. But in, in the words of John Maxwell, fail forward. Okay, and and learn from it. So, but be yourself. Share your story because I think that part of the healing process is sharing. And 
there's a great joy in knowing that in your being willing to be vulnerable and to share, uh, that in fact you can help others. You know, I mean, I, I'll never forget some of the first time on stage when I would, you know, out of nowhere share a story that then afterwards I'd go like, I'm not so sure I should have shared that. Like, you know, like what does that say about me that, you know, you know, that I failed in that way. But then people would come up afterwards and just go, you have no idea what an encouragement you were to me. Because because now, now I know I can deal with it. Now I know I can lead myself through it. So I said, be yourself, share your story, and definitely be the example, you know? Um, and that takes a lot of discipline and it takes courage and takes conviction. But if you believe in something, believe in something. That doesn't mean not listening to other people. It doesn't mean not collaborating, but be yourself, be the example, and make your choices wisely and respect other people's choices. We're in a very divided country right now about choices on many things. And so we tend to politicize everything. And it's very scary to me. But I respect other people's choices because they're making them for themselves. Once they're not making them for me, they're making them for themselves. So, you know, be a light in a dark world. Becky, that was a fantastic way to end this segment today is be a light in a very dark world. And you are inspirational, motivational, and most importantly, just an amazing, genuine person to be with. So thank you for spending your time with us today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. I want to thank you for tuning in to Adjusted Realities. We spoke to retired Brigadier General Becky Halstead about tools and tactics used in leading herself and others to greater success. What does it take for you to make that next step in leading yourself to greater success? Now, we all have failures and we all have opportunities to improve our own health. And there is no time like the present to commit to one thing that will make your life better. What is that one thing you can start doing today? This podcast was brought to you by the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress. As a special gift for listening today, visit f4cp.org slash health to get a copy of our Mind, Body, Spirit ebook, which focuses on many ways to optimize your health and the ones you love without the use of drugs or surgery. Don't forget to subscribe, share this podcast with family and friends, rate and review. If you're feeling inspired to learn more about chiropractic or to find a doctor of chiropractic near you, visit f4cp.org slash find a doctor. We appreciate your support and look forward to checking in with you again soon.